Okay, on behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies here at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, I'd like to welcome, welcome everyone to our first event of the spring quarter. It's really an honor and a privilege to have Daniel Brumberg uh, with us today. Uh, driving into school, I was trying to remember the first time I heard the name Daniel Brumberg. By accident, I stumbled across this uh, fascinating um, article in the Journal of Democracy called The Trap of Liberalized Autocracy in the Arab World. I read it very closely and it struck me immediately as a deeply insightful sort of analytical piece that accurately described uh, the reasons why um, political authoritarianism was persisting in the Arab world. And I've used that article many times in my courses and students have benefited from it. And it was around the same time when um, uh, Daniel Bernberg also authored a very good book on um, internal Iranian politics called Reinventing uh, Khomeini, uh, The Struggle for Reform in Iran, University of Chicago Press. It's a really great book. It, I, I used that book also when I was writing my doctoral dissertation. It didn't get the attention that I think it deserved, but it really is one of the great books um, of internal Iranian politics that I highly recommend to students. And in my view, Daniel Bromberg really is one of the leading, I think, experts in the world on the question of authoritarianism and democracy and its discontents um, in the Islamic world. Um, currently, he's the associate professor of, in the Department of Government at Georgetown University, and he's senior advisor with the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the U.S. Institute for uh, Peace. Uh, he's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Democracy, and the he's on the advisory board of the International Forum on Democratic Studies. Brumberg is also chairperson of the nonprofit foundation on, uh, on democratization and political change in the Middle East. He's, he's really authored um, hundreds of um, articles, op-ed pieces, um, policy briefs, um, someone whose writings I recommend to students who are seriously inter interested in the question of authoritarianism, democracy, its challenges in the Arab Islamic world. The name Daniel Brumberg cannot be ignored um, by students who are serious about the topic. Um, he's here today to deliver a lecture called The Arab Spring and the Dynamics of Global Autocracy which is a paper that he's uh, recently co-authored with Stephen Heidemann at the U.S. Institute for Peace. Um, his lecture will be followed by some brief critical comments from Tom Ferrer, um, the former dean at the Corbell School and current professor emeritus. I will facilitate perhaps some back and forth between the two, then we will open it up to questions and answers. Um, so please join me in uh, welcoming to the University of Denver, Daniel Bromberg. Well, I got to come here more often. That was great. I really appreciated that. I um, matter of thanks and thanks to the center for not only hosting me, but hosting our family who's sitting back here. The young man in that multicolored shirt is my sidekick, and he'll be ha asking some questions at the end of the lecture as well, such as when can we go? That would probably be his most important question. Um, and, uh, and so thanks very much for ha hosting us and making it possible uh, for us to visit with our family here. Um, and uh, we, really, we, re I, we really appreciate it, as I do as well. Um, and speaking of family, I, I was mentioning to my wife, Lori, the other day that um, I have a student, a former student. They're, all, they're always going to be your students, right? You know, Bassam Haddad, who wrote a good book on Syria. And when Bassam defended his dissertation, into the room walked his mother and 14 other members of his family. And it struck me at that point that you really can't be too tough on somebody when his mother is sitting there you know, and his brothers and cousins. It was a great strategy to make sure that we didn't grill him too hard. And, um, and, and beyond that, the next day he had us, his mother had us for lunch. So it was, uh, it was a great tactic and I'm using a similar tactic now with Lori and my family here to make sure that everybody's kind to me at the end of this lecture. I'm also using PowerPoint. When we walked in and my wife heard me say that I prepared PowerPoint, she was stupefied um, because I'm not nimble at this sort of thing and I only have two slides as a consequence. And if I can get from one to the other, I'm gonna feel very successful in that regard. Um, but the slides, I think, will nicely sum up uh, the point of the talk. And uh, it, global autocracy in the Arab Spring challenges for US diplomacy. Uh, the paper uh, that Netter uh, alluded to is a paper that I wrote with my colleague Stephen Heidemann, which is part of a much longer 
project that we've been working on for far too long. Um, you get stuck in one project and you have four others to uh, resolve and finish. And I took the opportunity, this paper was part of a series uh, that we were organizing at the, at the United States Institute of Peace. I took the opportunity to push this paper much further by way of framing some issues um, that would serve uh, for a longer article and perhaps down the road we hope a book. Um, but for now this is what we have and it's, it's, a, it's a detailed piece that takes this notion of global autocracy and applies it to, um, to the Arab world. The, the project itself was originally uh, not going to be focused on the Middle East per se. Uh, and you'll understand why in just a moment. The, the, uh, the, the project was to focus on the alliance work, inner, inner alliance workings and collaboration and cooperation between major authoritarian states, particularly Iran, China, and Russia, and how they defend their collective and respective interests in a regional and global context that is increasingly favoring democratic countries and democratic norms, particularly in the wake of the end of the Cold War. But along came the Arab Spring, and uh, suddenly uh, the Arab Spring itself became a kind of crucible through which we could test various propositions and hypotheses about how global authoritarian regimes work, because suddenly they were confronted by the possibility and we all were, the United States too, having supported authoritarian regimes for many years in the region, suddenly in the Arab world the game had changed, at least it seemed that it changed. And um, the possibility of democratic regimes uh, emerging in the region was a stunner not only for the United States but for global authoritarian regimes, which had already dealt, particularly with Russia, with the, pros with the, gr with the colored revolutions and the prospects for democratization in its so-called backyard. So we use the Arab Spring as a kind of crucible, as a context, as an arena, regional and, also, and otherwise, to look at how these states were reacting to um, democracy in a particular region and how that sort of process of apparent democratization, and each country in the Arab Spring has its own story to tell, but we wanted to see how these states reacted to that. And uh, it, by way of the telling the story, the paper is really grouped around two related stories or three. One is a kind of theoretical introduction where we do our homework as political scientists and lay out a few ideas about global authoritarianism. And, uh, and then having done that, we look at how global authoritarian states reacted to two major challenges. The first challenge was in Libya and the decision by the United States Security Council to authorize um, uh, uh, to pass a resolution, a resolution 1973, 1973, which provided the pretext uh, from the vantage point of global authoritarians for sure, or the basis from the vantage point of the United States and those who supported the resolution, the, the, the basis for a military, what was in effect a military inter intervention uh, led behind by, from the United States, but, but, uh, but in a more forward way by uh, Western states, among them England, um, and so that's part of the story. Um, suddenly you had um, the UN providing a resolution which allowed effectively for the intervention of the West against a local autocrat, uh, namely Gaddafi, which greatly worried the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians. Of course, the Iranians proclaimed the Arab Spring an Islamic revolution, but they couldn't be uh, that sure that, that it was going to go that direction. And uh, so that greatly worried them. And then the second part of the story we have to tell is the Syrian episode, because the Libyan situation set, the pre what set a potential precedent, and I emphasize potential precedent for um, further UN Security Council resolutions of a similar kind. You know from a legal point of view, a precedent is never a precedent until it's tested a second time and made a precedent. So the UN Security Council resolution 1973 was a potential precedent for authorizing global intervention to protect civilians. And the second was the Syrian crisis. And by the time we turned to the Syrian crisis, uh, the Russians and the Chinese who had abstained in Resolution 1973, permitting intervention in Libya, had some regrets. <laughs> uh, had, uh, they were a little unhappy with the outcome, perhaps to some extent justifiably so, because one can make an argument that uh, the resolution was used uh, and there was a dynamic of mission creep that allowed for a far greater and more robust intervention by the West than might otherwise be interpreted from the resolution itself. But by the time we get to the Syrian story, 
global authoritarians are waking up to what's going on around them again, and they're saying we have to work collectively to make sure that in the case of Syria, there's no other uh, uh, basis for the UN to authorize intervention against Assad and in favor of the opposition. So the, the story of the Arab Spring and the story of Libya and the story of Syria becomes a, an arena by which these states, for their own, per, for their own strategic and political interests, are going to try to draw a line in the sand, to use a terribly overused metaphor from the Middle East, um, and say, you know, this, this we will not let go any further. We, we were sold a bill of goods in Libya, and, um, and we're not going to let it go further. Why was the Libyan story very important from the point of view of global authoritarians, which, which I'll discuss, I'll kind of explain this map in a second, but why was Resolution 1973 such a potential challenge for these regimes? It was a potential challenge because the resolution itself incorporated the doctrine of R2P, the responsibility to protect, into the, resolu into the resolution itself. Um, and particularly in two articles, Article 3 and Article 4 of 1970, Resolution 1973, which authorized member states to act and to intervene to protect local civilians from retribution by the Qaddafi regime. The language used by uh, in 19, Resolution 1973 did not explicitly adopt R2P, but used the language of R2P repeatedly. And this was an historic moment in that sense because the R2P, the responsibility to protect, the, the, the norm had been established in 2005 by the General Assembly of the United Nations, but it hadn't been adopted and hadn't been used in a UN Security Council resolution until the Libyan situation. So suddenly you had this extraordinary possibility, not only of a, of a political, but a legal precedent that might then be used against, who knows, uh, other actors affiliated with or linked to global authoritarian regimes, or in the case of perhaps Iran or other states against these countries themselves. So they were determined um, to um, respond because what global authoritarian states are really worried about is not only their capacity to rule at home, uh, but also the emergence and evolution of global norms of, of international governance and human rights. Uh, blessed by the UN Security Council, uh, increasingly adopted by new emerging democracies in a way, in a, in a dynamic that from the vantage point of Iran, China, uh, and, and Russia and their closest authoritarian al allies such as North Korea and Venezuela and so on, from the vantage point of these countries, the evolution of the global uh, arena is not advantageous from a legal and political point of view in many ways. And their, their, their concern is to create an impediment to this dynamic, to find ways to collaborate regionally and globally, uh, and to make sure that in so doing, um, they create a counterweight to the West, to the United States and its Western allies, and a counterweight to any potential emergence of new states that are going to increasingly ally with the West. That's, that's the concern. Of course, and ultimately, this is about reinforcing an authoritarian agenda in ways that will allow them to rule at home and sustain their relationship, their, their political domestic relationships as well. So as you can tell from the little I have said already, there's a great deal at stake uh, in this whole gambit. And so let's talk a little bit about global authoritarians with this really fancy, I did, I had a much more ambitious notion of uh, circular uh, circles and counter circles and, and I spent about an hour and then settled for this uh, <laughs> uh, because I'm new at this kind of game. But I think it does sort of the job. I mean, we have Russia, China, and Iran. As, if this were a series of concentric circles, to use the old Nasserist metaphor, um, uh, if, if this was a series of concentric circles, Russia and China and Iran would be the core countries. And of course, they have important trade and political relationships. And we've looked in our, in our, in our study, we've, we've, uh, we have accumulated a lot of the kind of structural information about their trade relationships with these and other states that demonstrate sort of the underpinnings, the structural underpinnings of global autocracy. Um, and of course, you would want to add non-state actors such as Hamas and Hezbollah as well to this list as two. I'd forgotten about that, but that's very important. And so those are the sort of two main sets of allies. But then, of course, you have a broader set of countries and the concentric circles would expand. We would go to um, uh, new democracies, emerging democracies, or consolidating democracies. Some have been around longer than others. Some have questionable democratic credentials, but countries such as South Africa, Brazil, India, Turkey, they're not only uh, 
aspiring new democracies, but they aspire, and this is really important in terms of what we're studying, to a regional role. You know, in the wake of the Arab Spring, the main conflict that is emerging in many ways is between Egypt and Turkey, <laughs> not between Egypt and Iran, for example. So we have these states, and then we have Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen. These are, these are transitional states. This, is, this sort of sums up much of the Arab Spring for you. And um, the goal of our uh, main core states is, not, is, is to use their leverage to, in some sense, enhance their relationships with these states, and at the same time, uh, enhance their leverage with these new emerging democracies in ways that if, 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 they, if this dynamic does not prevent democratization, they at least can have some assurance that at the end of the day, whatever the consequence of these dynamics, and each one has its own local dynamic that's very difficult to generalize. Nader, you've just come back from t Tunisia. Things are very much a Tunisian story there. But nevertheless, the, the, the broader concerns of the, uh, of the global autocracies is to make sure that at the end of the day, whatever kinds of regimes emerge here, even if they are dem democracies of one kind or other, are friendly, or at least the, at the very least not hostile. Global authoritarian regimes have assets and liabilities. I'm going <coughs> to list them very <coughs> quickly. <coughs> uh, one of the assets is their informality. I mean, this, these relationships are not based very much on formal treaties. But they're ad hoc. Um, some of them are more structured than others. But the ad hocness of these relationships, the informality of the structure that creates global authoritarianism, uh, allows for a great deal of flexibility, innovation, and adaptability. Um, these regimes are united not so much by what they share in terms of commonalities, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but by what they oppose. <laughs> I mean, they're united by their concerns, uh, their shared concerns about the, the evolution of the international arena, the possibility of uh, 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 not a multipolarity, but a one polar system organized around the United States and its allies. Uh, uh, by uh, they are united around their opposition to the dissimulation of uh, dissemination of global norms of human rights and and democracy. Um, and they are uh, united by the role that in many of these countries that oil plays in funding their regimes as well in the oil market. But that's not true across all these regimes. Obviously, China is not an oil producer. It's an oil explorer, high tech and central to the oil market, but in many different ways, they're not a producer. The liabilities of global authoritarianism are important to list. They really are the key to the capacity of the United States and its allies to mine and work and manipulate those liabilities, those tensions, in ways that will minimize the capacity for collective action among global authoritarian regimes. Uh, first of all, they're very diverse. There are some elements of their political systems that are similar, but culturally, religiously, politically, economically, they're very diverse. Um, and this is very important because, particularly when it comes to China, China is much more intertwined with the global Western economy than particularly Iran, except for the sale of oil. But China, look, you, all you have to do is look at the debate about what we're going to do with our deficit in the United States. And that means that China is not necessarily going to always go along with everything that other members of this coalition want, because it always has to be very careful to look behind its back and see how its actions are affecting its Western friends or its Western uh, associates or whatever you wish to call them. So it's not, a, it's not a homogeneous group. It's diverse, and that creates tensions. But the level of economic interdependence and the nature of such interdependence differs and they allow for different, uh, different levels of contestation uh, within each state. And that fact alone opens up possibilities for the United States uh, that is important as well. Iran has become increasingly a much more authoritarian regime, some would say. Uh, key geographic and institutional arenas of global authoritarian action. Um, we've already say, stated that they, they interact with uh, these regimes as their sort of most lo loyal allies. They are, in some sense, allies. but they're. Real concern is the arena of interaction between these two groups, that outer core. And what's really interesting about the outer core states, and this is where the paper, I think, begins to get more interesting empirically, um, what's really interesting about the interaction of Russia, China, and Iran with these states is the following. First of all, um, uh, all of these states, to one extent or the another, another want to support um, democracy and the leaders of these governments have an interest in advancing some sort of democratic agenda at home. We can have a useful debate about whether the Muslim Brethren is achieving this sort of objective in, in, uh, in Egypt, but they would say that what they're achieving is a version of democracy that is 
culturally authentic to Islam. We can talk about that. But they share not only a domestic democratic agenda, but they are open to and sympathetic to global no norms of democracy and human rights. And that is why so many of the Arab states were such keen supporters of the Libyan Resolu Resolution 1973 and the language adopted in that, particularly in regard to the protection of, of vulnerable citizens. Um, and so the, the, the interesting uh, challenge for um, global authoritarians, there's sort of two challenges the paper talks about. On, the one, on one level, the global authoritarians would like to um, speak to these countries in language that they understand, which, and, and at the same time, they would like to advance a different agenda which is more authoritarian. Interestingly enough, as I point out in the paper, some of the issues and concerns of the global authoritarians are shared by these states. All of these states want a more multipolar world. All of these states have concerns about Western hegemony. All of these concerns, all these states have some concerns about the, what they view as an unequal distribution of economic wealth on a global level. And all these, all these states have concerns about the way in which power dynamics are reflected in the, in the Security Council itself at the UN. So the interesting challenge of, um, of the global authoritarians is to sort of leverage this resentment, which may be well earned, by the way. I'm not, uh, and let's keep in mind that when the United States supports global norms of governance and democracy and human rights, it does so in ways that are highly uneven. Let's be diplomatic about it, or you could say hypocritical. I mean, we still have close authoritarian allies. We have some problems with The Hague and, and supporting uh, uh, the International Court of Justice. So that we, you know, we're not there supporting these norms in a consistent fashion. And these countries greatly resent and are looking for ways to collaborate among themselves. Uh, and so the challenge for the uh, global authoritarians is to exploit and leverage that resentment at the same time not appear to be supporting an anti-democratic agenda. And the other game from the vantage point of these states is to advance their democratic agenda while at the same time echoing the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of third worldist anti-hegemonic discourse of the core states of global authoritarian. And this is kind of, we refer to it in the paper as a kind of an elaborate dance. Each side is trying to sort of have its cake and eat it too. Um, and in many respects, the paper traces uh, this story and the dynamics of this story. And what's interesting, and I'm not going to go on in much detail, there's a lot of detail in the paper, and you're welcome uh, to, to read it. Um, the, one of the more interesting sections of the paper looks at the, this game in terms of the discourse and how sort of different players. Um, and what's interesting about uh, the first story, the Libya story, uh, is the extent to which, as I mentioned before, China and Russia decided not to get in the way. Iran had no vote, happily enough. And the Chinese and, uh, and Russian uh, veto uh, abstentions of the, on the resolution in 1973 were couched in language which, which would suggest, of course, that they were open to many elements of the, uh, of the resolution on Libya, whereas Iran was just damning. <laughs> And Khamenei just said, this is, this, is, this is all about the West opposing its hegemony. And so immediately around the Libyan story, you could already see, already see the tensions within global authoritarianism. China did not want to be seen as to be blocking this resolution, and it chose not to. China also had huge or considerable financial stakes in Libya in, in supporting the oil exploration business as well. So it had concrete interest in not getting in the way. But the bigger question was, well, if you're China, and you're, you know, you're want to act as, and behave as a superpower, you can't behave like you're wrong. You just can't go damning the international community, uh, particularly when it didn't seem from the vantage point of Russia and China that things were going so badly. Um, and then, of course, we get to this situation in which within the first few months of the, the resolution, um, the resolution is going in ways that authorize intervention on a far greater and uh, expanse than ever anticipated by the Chinese and the Russians. And so uh, what you see is a joint communique in June 17, 2001, in which China and Russia uh, uh, condemned the willful interpretation and, and expanded application of Resolution 1973. And they really feel burned. They, get, they sense they are really getting burned, and not only do they sense they are getting burned, when the Syrian story emerges and there's the rebellion in Syria, and questions arise as to whether the United States, or whether the Security Council is going to issue a similar resolution, what you find from 
Russia, China, and Iran is they're more or less on the same page at that point, with some interesting differences, and the paper goes into those interesting differences. Iran is vociferous in damning and in basically saying that, that this is, uh, that in praising the regime in Damascus and, and, and supporting it to the hilt and saying that they are drawing a line there and they're not going to support it. The Chinese and the Russians oppose any UN security resolution for intervention along the lines of the Libyan resolution, but their language is more modern. They want to have their cake and eat it too because they don't want to alienate the Arab world and they don't want to be seen on the wrong side of history. They would like to sort of play a double game. So the consequence is that um, you have this sort of game. And the precedent, of course, is uh, depressing because from the vantage point, I think, of Russia and China and Iran, they won that round. They managed to make sure uh, exploiting many of the concerns. Uh, and let's keep in mind as well that um, several of these countries um, uh, were, on the, were, were temporary members of the United States, uh, of the UN Security Council during the Libyan crisis. And they abstained as well. And they justified their abstentions by saying that, well, we support the Libyan people, but we have real concerns about uh, inter international intervention and national sovereignty. And we want to protect those ideals as well. So there was a great deal of ambivalence already from some of these countries, Brazil, South Africa, India in particular. Their spokesman in the UN said, well, we have concerns about intervention. And therefore, we're not, while we support the Libyan people, we are, we are also drawing our own line in the sand. And the consequence of these converging lines was from the vantage point of uh, Iran, China, and Russia. It was basically to prevent any international mobilization on behalf of the opposition. Uh, in, um, in, in Syria. Of course, the Obama administration isn't interested in, in, in from what we can tell, in, in providing any exhaustive or, or compelling support for the opposition there as well, so we wouldn't want to lay the blame. And I'm really, this is not a blame game. This is trying to understand the long-term evolution of these dynamics and how and what ways the collective action of these states lay down certain kinds of markers that basically are inhibiting the ultimate um, the ultimate evolution of the international system and important norms such as R2P, the responsibility to protect. And finally, I would also uh, draw your attention to the particular role of, of, um, of Egypt in this game. Now, this is very interesting. As many of you know, uh, Morsi traveled uh, not long ago to Tehran to attend the, uh, the summit of the non-aligned movement. Um, and there, he gave a speech in which he tried to play this game as well. And, th and by that, I mean he tried to basically defend the notion of democracy. He tried to defend certain norms of international governance and human rights. At the same time, he tried to bandwagon on the kind of anti-imperialist, anti-Western rhetoric of the Iranians, and which has some resonance in the non-aligned movement. Um, and he gave a speech, which I'm going to quote for from uh, uh, just to give you a taste of sort of how this game is played. He said, the new Egypt, after the blessed revolution of the 25th of January, is seeking a just international system that brings the developing countries from the realm of poverty, subordination and marginalization, to the realm of prosperity, leadership, and power. It is no longer acceptable, acceptable at all to respect the foundations of democracy on the level of the state and to ignore them on the level of international law. And from here, Egypt believes that one of the core pillars of this new international system lies in enhancing the contribution of developing countries in managing and reforming institutions of global govern governance to guarantee the fairness of participation and framing the directions on the international arenas politically, economically, and socially. So here he was very much echoing a third world, third worldist perspective, if we could call it that. Sort of trying to leverage that. The Egyptian leader, Morsi, president, the president of Egypt, is very much interested in making Egypt one of the leaders of this newly revived non-aligned movement. At the same time, in the same speech, he chastised the Syrian government and by reference, the, his host, the Iranians, for supporting Assad and his regime and really created an enormous amount of friction. He also engaged in a bit of Sunni Shia sort of language that suggested they're also the kind of, we can talk about this in question and answers, the kind of Sunni Shia aspect of this, of this dynamic. But what was clear was that Morsi was trying to leverage his role as the leader of, of Egypt, as a purported leader of Egypt from the vantage point of some 
of Egypt's citizens. In any case, trying to leverage that by, on the one hand, uh, indulging in this sort of rhetoric, third worldist rhetoric, bandwagging on it, suggesting Egypt play a role, always thinking about Turkey behind its back. And of course, the interesting thing that to keep in mind is that whole event in Tehran occurred after he had visited China. His first step, his first overseas trip as president was to China and then to Iran. So he was very carefully sort of uh, demonstrating sort of where the pecking order was as far as he was concerned and where Egypt's interests were, were, were organized. What does this all mean for U.S. foreign policy? And I'm going to end on a few points about this and then we can have some discussion and uh, some debate. Well, certainly from the point of view of the United States, um, global authoritarianism and the story suggests it represents a, a, a real challenge. Um, uh, not a lethal challenge by any stretch of the imagination, but to the extent that we're serious about promoting global norms of democracy and human rights, and as I suggested before, we're not always as consistent, and often we are hypocritical about that, but to the extent that we and or our allies are serious about doing that, to the extent that we are serious about making the UN the forum to advance this, uh, this was something of a setback to the US and its allies, and the evolving situation in Syria doesn't help at all in that regard. Um, uh, but at the same time, the United States has to deal with the fact that in the Arab Spring countries, we have governments that are emerging that are to various degrees responsible to the electorate. <laughs> this is a unprecedented situation for many of these countries. And we have to recognize that the New Egypt, for example, while it's going to try to maintain, even more so will try to maintain cordial relations with the United States because the military aspect is crucial to its interests, at the same time, they're going to reflect an independence. We're going to have to learn how to deal with it and not respond to it in stupid or foolish ways that only antagonize these regimes and make them more hostile to us. So we're going to have to deal with that. And that means a more nuanced and flexible diplomacy from the United States. In terms of the Middle East, it also means that we have to be able to engage as many of these players as possible. I'm a big proponent of engaging Iran. I think that the one thing that the Iran's hardliners do not want is engagement. I think that the fissures within the regime are there. And the, to the extent that we can find a means to engage Iran, we, we would uh, help sort of to pull it out of this, this more natural orbit. The more these states are, are declared enemies, the more they have an incentive to work together. So I think engagement and finding a solution to the nuclear question is very important in that regard. Um, and I think on the broader regional level as well, what's really crucial is for the United States to get serious about the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Because there, you can be sure that if we think that this thing is going to just sit and not explode and we can sit, stand back and not be engaged, we're going to be sorely mistaken in the outbreak of more conflict either between uh, Egypt and Israel, or between I Israel, Hamas, or, or Hezbollah will create enormous opportunities for global authoritarians and their allies to once again leverage regional resentment in ways that will play very badly for the United States. So we have a lot of sort of new agendas to think about. It calls for a kind of new, new, a new kind of diplomacy. Uh, we suggest some elements of it. And whether this is going to come to pass is a question we'll just have to wait to see. Thank you very much. Dan, I'm going to ask you to have a seat for a second. Tom Fair um, um, has uh, been generous with his time. To, um, he's agreed to come here. He's actually, unlike myself, read your paper. Um, um, uh, and so I'm going to ask him to come and uh, sort of pr provide us with his critical comments and thoughts on, on, on your lecture. Absolutely. Want your glasses? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll decide. Uh, I'll take that for now. I, you know, you, you arrive at this age where you've got to decide what you're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so much easier being a discussant if you hate the paper that's been presented. <laughs> and you can attack it like a ravening beast and try to claw out its intestines. Uh, unfortunately, I read the paper, as now said, it's a wonderful paper. I learned from it, which is the principal test, I think, of a paper, as far as I'm concerned, do I learn from this paper? And it's, it's written with great lucidity and analytical power. Uh, so all I, I thought I might do is present the, the thoughts that occurred to me and that's another test of a paper. Does it stimulate you to, to think? And, and how does it stimulate you to, to think? And maybe think about American foreign policy in a bit of its larger, larger setting. 
And these ideas, I'm sure, in the background of your own thinking, Dad, but you, you only had so many pages within which to express your thoughts, and you had to focus on a particular, a more narrow issue, but I'm sure you were seeing it in a larger, larger context. Let, let me begin with an observation of Stanley McChrystal, the former head of, of our forces in, in Afghanistan, before that the head of special forces in Iraq. He was interviewed in Foreign Affairs, some of you may have seen the interview, and I was particularly struck by his description of the four intellectual processes he went through, he and his colleagues went through when he was in, in Iraq. He said, the first question we asked was, where's the enemy? That was the intelligence question. And then he said, as we got smarter, we started to ask, who is the enemy? And then we realized that that wasn't the right question, and we asked, what's the enemy trying to do? But finally, we got to the really fundamental, most important question, why are they the enemy? Uh, I, thought, I thought that was an extraordinarily interesting series of thoughts, and it told me a lot about McChrystal, about his, his, his capacity for reflection. And here's a man who created the most effective killing machine in the modern, in the modern age. So just bearing that in mind, I, after reading, reading your paper, Dan, I thought of four questions which, which sort of surround the paper in my, in my mind. And one is, what are and what should be the grand strategic goals of the United States globally in the wider Islamic world and in the Middle East? And at a very high level of abstraction, it's very easy to state them because they're the same for every, every country. Uh, that is, at the state level, they are political independence, territorial integrity, the easy things for us and the welfare of the American population and the physical security of the American population, which turns out to be a little more complicated post 9-11 than we thought, thought it was. Uh, the second question that occurred to me is, what are the principal means that the U.S. has actually employed over the last, let's say, 60 years in trying to achieve these grand strategic goals. And a very crude, in a very crude summary form, I would say they are military and intelligence vehicles. Now, military is a complicated concept. There are a lot of ways in which you can employ power, you can employ cooperatively, you can employ coercively. Uh, but I would still say that if we, if we divide the world of influence projection into hard power and soft power, then I would say the emphasis in our means for carrying out our grand strategic goals has been hard power rather than soft power. I'm not saying this critically, I'm just, it's just an, an observation. Uh, what would be an example of soft power? It's much easier to recognize hard power. What, what would be an example of soft power? Uh, we've spent already over a trillion dollars, incremental dollars, in, as a consequence of the Iraq war. Some say it's already two trillion dollars, but let's, let's say it was a trillion or a trillion and a half. We'll divide it, split it down the middle. Now suppose we'd used half of those incremental dollars to fund schools for poor kids in Middle East and West Asia and established a trust which would be the direct board of directors would be constituted by Islamic intellectuals from various countries that we think of as not necessarily pro-American, but moderate in their views, and, and theologians oriented more toward Sufism than Wahhabism. Uh, would that have any consequence? Well, that's, that's a second question, a separate question, which I'm not even prepared to address. I'm just saying that that would be an example of soft of soft power. Or another example of soft power, to kickstart new negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, suppose we guaranteed that we would provide a million dollars for every single Palestinian refugee family, because one of the, one of the difficult issues in the negotiations all along is in what to do about the refugees. And turning them all from pathetic supplicants into millionaires overnight would be a dramatic, a dramatic step. 
uh, whether it would be an effective catalyst, I don't know. But it certainly would be an example of soft power. And are these conceivable things? That's a separate question. But I just wanted to, I, the word soft power sometimes just doesn't evoke anything. It just sits there. You know. But there are many examples of soft power which easily come to mind. They usually involve the expenditure of money. Uh, the, the third question I asked myself was, can one imagine a US foreign policy over the past 60 years that might have advanced these grand strategic goals more effectively? Yes, sure one, one can. Uh, if, if we'd adopted George Kennan's view of containment rather than Paul Nitz's view of containment, then the whole way of relating to what we now call the Global South, which we used to call the Third World, would have been different. There probably wouldn't have been a Vietnam War. We probably wouldn't have provided the sort of mindless assets for jihadism against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan that we did, which had consequences which I think we're still, we're still feeling today. And the final question was, given the, the nature of the United States, is it really conceivable that we would have pursued a different trajectory, foreign policy trajectory over the past 60 years than the one that we did? Or is there here such an, an element of past dependency which flows from our entire history, uh, the, the political structure, the ideology of the society that, well, we did pretty much what we were doomed, we were doomed to do. So th those are the, the questions that, that I thought about. It sort of frames the, the more detailed issues that Dan addressed so, so brilliantly. So let me conclude, because we want to leave time for discussion. This is, I'm, I'm just trying to help to stimulate, maybe frame the discussion. Three observations. Uh, one, does US soft policy affect public attitudes in other countries? Well, there's some evidence that it do. It does. Uh, opinion polling in Indonesia prior to the tsunami had Osama bin Laden as considerably more popular than the United States. Opinion polling after the very, very uh, dramatic assistance that the US Navy provided in Indonesia after the tsunami resulted, according to the same polling, in a jump of at least 20 percentage points in the perception of the United States. So, if you believe that public attitudes matter, and one could say that they matter more as democratization of one kind or another spread, that, although I think they've even exercised some influence on authoritarian governments in the past, then you want to think more about soft policy. Soft policy becomes a more, potentially more important ingredient of foreign policy. Second, with respect to the the emphasis on the military instrument, I was struck by another point that McChrystal made in that interview. He was asked about the use of drones, and this is what he said. If we were to use our technological capabilities carelessly, then we should not be upset when someone responds with their equivalent, which is a suicide bomb in Central Park, because that's what they can respond with. And that goes back to one of our grand strategic obje objectives, which is the physical security of American citizens. And, and finally, I, I am led to recall Lawrence Wright's book about Osama bin Laden and his intellectual, emotional transformation uh, in, in that, what I thought was a very good book, The, the Looming Towers. If you've read that, how many have read Wright's book. Well, a few people have. You recall that the U.S. was not his target uh, initially. He had a religion. He was a religious to begin with. He became more intensely religious as he grew older. He, he was in Afghanistan. But the U.S. as the target, as the problem, that evolved over, over time. And was it inevitable? 
And I guess the last point I'll leave you with, when we're talking about things we might have done differently, we're talking about the trajectory, the arc of American foreign policy, one possible approach to foreign policy would have been to be consistent, much more consistent, both in terms of not supporting authoritarian governments, having correct diplomatic relations with them, which is different from providing them with military and intelligence support. Um, that 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 would that would would matter, um, but also being consistent in supporting the basic principles of the United Nations Charter, because if we had been consistent when Iraq invaded Iran in 1980 we would have supported Iran, right? Collective defense against an act of aggression. Iraq attacked Iran. If we had, then it's very unlikely that Iraq would have invaded Kuwait. And if, and if Iraq had not invaded Kuwait, then we would not have had troops in Saudi Arabia. And remember the number one reason given by Osama bin Laden for 9-11 was U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia. So those are just a few thoughts that your wonderful paper, Dan, uh, stimulated. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you very much for those stimulating thoughts and comments. We have a tradition here that the keynote speaker has the option of responding to the discussant or going directly to Q&A well, with the I'm audience. I'm going to answer now but only because I can't keep everything in my mind. More Come on up. Yeah, sure. Those are great comments. We, uh, we have a friend at home uh, uh, who, uh, Leon Wieselter, who has the concept of conference building measures. Um, uh, and I think that this, you, you've given me a, a great idea for a conference building measure, which would be all the ideas that you set out for, uh, in response to my paper, because we couldn't begin to sort of discuss them. I will tell you that, that I don't think anybody, any president, if you go all the way back to uh, Bush Fies, um, uh, was prepared for the kinds of challenges we're talking about here. Certainly, of course, from the perspective, and by the way, just for purposes of diplomacy, these are my personal points of view. They don't reflect um, any, any public stance that can be attributed to any institution for which I work. It's always useful to say. Um, uh, you know, Bush wasn't prepared. He thought, well, I'm operating in a, in, a, in a unipolar world. I can have my cake and eat it, too. I can fashion this world the way I want. And look what happened. You were alluding to this at the end of your you know, presentation. Uh, and of course his father did too, and they, they came back to haunt us um, in our relationships with Iraq and our relationships with Iran, and the belief we can impose us on our views and we, we were living with the consequences. So I think that he was, certainly wasn't prepared for this and would have seen this as a kind of excuse of some kind, maybe from uh, kind of the liberal intelligentsia or something like that. Um, now, I, I think that uh, 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 Clinton was more sort of, uh, was sort of a, a transitional president in, tr in, try in terms of trying to deal with these sorts of issues, was working them out, but hadn't quite arrived. And I think Obama intellectually, and I emphasize intellectually, has a sense of these concerns and appointed a lot of people who might want to sort of deal with the soft power issues and find ways to sort of address these sorts of challenges in a more effective way, knowing that the capacity for milita military power to resolve or, or address these challenges is limited and that soft power is very important and we have to define it and make it real. I just, th just, and this is, I just do not think that Obama has a sense, if I may be very direct about it, about how to translate grand ideas and concepts into effective strategy. And I think this has been his Achilles heel from the very beginning, whether it's dealing with Iran. And, and I can't blame him in one sense. You know, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. I'm the son of, a, uh, my late father was a prominent Sovietologist, and I've lived in this and worked in this town a long time. And, you know, it's very hard to see where policymaking ever stretches beyond a few weeks. Uh, in fact, we, I hosted a bunch of Tunisian colleagues last week, and we went to the National Security Council uh, to talk about Tunisia uh, a week and a half ago, and our colleagues at the NSC said, let's talk about what's happened in the last six days. You know, that's, that was their parameter. So I'm not very optimistic about coming up with a kind of strategic vision whether it's dealing with any one of these countries, China, Iran, or collectively, that would solve the problem, I'm sorry to say. Okay, let's open the floor. Or address the problem, not solve it, because it's not going to be solved.
let's open the floor to some uh, questions and comments. I'm going to, um, well, since I'll be up here taking the questions, um, I'll repeat them for the sake of the, uh, the cameras. Go ahead. I was interested by your comment that Iraq, Egypt's greatest rivalry is increasingly with Turkey instead of Iran. Can you expand on that? Yeah, the question has to do with the um, sort of the, the, you alluded to emerging tensions between sure. Turkey and Egypt, which is something that a lot of people haven't foreseen. Well, you know, Egypt was for many decades the Sunni Arab powerhouse, diplomatically and militarily. And then it sort of stepped aside. And uh, that stepping aside process came in concert with, um, with the peace treaty with Israel, in fact. It no longer had the capacity to really use its military and therefore uh, was not a kind of player in this in a Sunni Middle East world. Um, certainly it is a rival with Iran, but it has certain interest in, in patching things up. But its bigger concern is who exercises leverage in the Sunni uh, Middle East. And Turkey is the country that exercises leverage. It established democracy uh, with certain kinds of negatives attached to it, yes, but no, and a powerful military and so on. So I think Egypt sees Turkey as its rival. I recall that when uh, uh, Erdogan came to Cairo uh, during his Middle East trip a year, year and a half ago, or perhaps more than that, there were tensions between him and the Muslim Brethren because, of course, the AK Party uh, sees itself as a kind of an exemplar of a kind of post-Islamist ideology in which Islam serves as a basis for identity but not the foundation for political action. And the Muslim Brethren simply said, we reject this. And there was, that said accentuated the tensions. And then Erdogan went on to Tunisia and they loved him because this is what the Nakhda party wanted to hear. So there's a real tension. It's partly strategic and it's partly ideological. Who has the mantle of Islam and Islamism and how do we define it? And this is a challenge for the Muslim brethren because the, the, the post-Kamalist legacy, which the Ak party claims to embrace, by the way, they say we are more loyal to Kamal in many respects than anybody else, is something that is troubling to the, to the Muslim brethren as well. Dan. Yeah, following up on that, it seems to me that one country missing from that particular uh, piece of the puzzle that you've um, constructed here is Saudi Arabia. And um, the, uh, I mean, there's a sense, I think the Egypt-Turkey uh, axis that you're talking about is a very interesting one. But in many ways, what's going on is this sort of uh, proxy war, cold war, cold proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran for the uh, shape of the Arab Spring, right? And regional hegemony. And as you know, I've just returned from Tunisia as well, and one, one, one the thing that struck me there is that for all the debates and uh, very strong differences of opinion today in Tunisian society between sort of liberal, secular, and left forces and, and more Islamist forces, one thing that everybody seemed to agree on was that Saudi Arabia and Qatar represent a huge problem in the region and specifically in Tunisia. Um, and, and obviously that debate rages regarding Syria. So um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on Saudi Arabia's role yeah. in this constellation that you've been describing, I think very uh, persuasively um, in, in, the, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And specifically, I'd like to know your thoughts on um, how you know, what, what, what sorts of challenges the Saudi uh, element presents for U.S. foreign policy, specifically in this uh, new constellation? Yeah. So the question just for the cameras is, where does Saudi Arabia fit into this whole picture? It's a great question. Um, of, course, of course, Saudi Arabia doesn't exercise much in the way of uh, military power, but in terms of economic soft power and diplomatic power, it's very influential. And our colleagues, both Islamists and non-Islamists in Tunisia, are worried about the Saudis. But they, they, their worries are not necessarily shared by the Egyptian government, um, who uh, have banked literally and figuratively on Saudi and Qatari support for a long time. Now, what has happened, of course, is that's backfired on the Muslim Brethren, because the money has found its, ways to the, to its way to the Salafists. And that has put the Muslim Brethren in a great deal of pain, because they really find themselves incapable in many respects of um, competing with the Salafists. One reason why I think that they're making peace with the state, because they really need the state to contain the Salafists. Uh, and that's a prescription, of, co of course, for more authoritarianism. But it, it speaks to the influence uh, uh, of 
Saudi Arabia and Qatar and, and, and the private sort of funding that's coming there. And it speaks both to the common interests as well as the tensions between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, uh, particularly owing to the fact that the Saudis are able to funnel money to the Salafists, and the Salafists are quite explicit in rejecting so much of the, uh, of the platform of the Muslim Brethren, who they see, uh, to use an old-fashioned word, as too bourgeois. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, and that's, that's a major problem. But I think that Morsi is clever enough to sort of deal with this, these tensions um, and because they recognize that ultimately they, have to, they want to get along with the Saudis and so on and they need that money and their financial crunch is, 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 cannot be remedied without having some sort of support from the Gulf. But it's a difficult, it puts them in some difficult situations. You're absolutely right. You know, this, the, um, the legal system in Egypt uh, is organized in a way that such that if you're a, if you're an NGO working on social and economic uh, social is issues, uh, your funding is has to be closely monitored by the state. But if you're a religious NGO, there's absolutely no legal constraints and no supervision from the state at all. So now we, in Egypt we have this enormous difficulty of an old legal regime that allowed millions and millions of dollars to funnel into so-called religious charities and into the pockets of the Salafists. And one way of trying to map how the Egyptians are responding to this is, there, if, if, is, is to ask whether they're, whether they're willing to redefine the legal basis for charitable giving in ways that will allow them to limit this process. And thus far, the evidence suggests is that they're only concentrating on the money that, com that comes to the secularists, which is not a good sign, uh, because the secularists are not their problem for better or for worse. Yeah, question at the front. Yeah, you go ahead. Um, I'm from Libya, so my friend here. So I wanted to ask about when you said a potential president, the no-fly zone of Libya. I think in the hearts and minds of Libyans and Syrians, it, it is a president. Syrians today and Libyans said, oh, the US intervened. So it wasn't because it was a humanitarian act. So, uh, why we saw the world rally behind the you no know, fly zone in a very swift way? Why didn't we see, why didn't the Obama administration continue supporting post Gaddafi? The situation is the in turmoil today. And we see a lot of lackluster uh, in terms of US support post Gaddafi. Just read a question about US policy in toward Libya vis-a-vis uh, -vis U.S. policy in Syria? How do you explain the difference? And then why isn't the United States supporting Libya uh, to the extent that it did in the lead up to the U.S.? Also, we only get, the U.S. only, only gets 5% of its oil from the light coup in Libya. Why did we see reluctance in Syria and not in Libya? Well, those are very good questions. First of all, I mean, from the, certainly from the vantage point, of the Libyan people, this was a precedent. But I meant, what I meant to say was only in legal terms does a president become a precedent when the next court decides to invoke it as a basis for a judgment. If it simply ignores it, you don't get the same sort of effect. And in this particular case, the next arena by which this, this possible precedent would be tested was the international response to Syria. And our colleagues in, among these states were, make, were we're darn sure that they were going to make sure that the Security Council would not invoke the, the responsibility to protect R2P another time to justify intervention. Now, you know, why, why does the, what explains the reticence of the uh, Obama administration? I'm not exactly sure. I must tell you, by the way, that USAP has a lot of programs in Libya. My colleagues I, are very deeply involved, but they're, they're, they're small. They're not huge programs, but they, could, they might make a difference. We're not totally disengaged. But it's not unusual for the U.S. government to come in and support an action, and then the follow-up is not what you would want it to be. Um, I think the intervention was seen, it was first of all improvised, which of course was what worried our colleagues from the global authoritarian states, but also in terms of the sort of geographic sort of challenges and the regional challenges, the U.S. felt they could support intervention in ways that wouldn't have too much blowback, but, but that's what they calculated. And the, and the geographic realities on the ground were very different from the series. Syrian sort of arena where the perception was that we could get sucked into a war that would go on for, and this perception may be justified, and therefore there was a great, there was a lot more reticence from the Obama administration to involve itself. And then of course we have the whole question of 
Turkey, the Russians, the Iranians, and sort of the possibility, the, the possibility for uh, destabilization throughout the region. You can argue, of course, that's exactly what's happening anyway. And that, uh, uh, you know, I think the, our problem in Syria is an absence of a kind of coherent strategy, once again, for dealing with it. We do have, and I think this is important to keep in mind, my colleague Stephen Heidemann uh, at USAP is deeply involved in working with the Syrian opposition. There's a lot of work that has gone on with the Syrian opposition. But this is one particular case where some readiness to provide the opposition with military support that would have allowed them to compel the, uh, the regime, if it was ever willing to negotiate, might have been useful. A, a calculated uh, risk, of course, but in the absence of that, you have either a regime that's going to prevail or you have support for the, for the Salafists and the Jihadists who have really taken over on the ground in the opposition. So it's, you know, it's, it's really played out in an unfortunate way, and we may ultimately pay a very high price for that as well. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm from India too, and uh, English, is not my, English is not my first language, so excuse me. And uh, uh, I'm from the city of Benghazi that started in Indonesia. So I have some questions actually, my friend asked some of them, but okay, we didn't see the same uh, act or the same um, you know, action towards Libya uh, as, uh, for example, in Bahrain, we didn't see that. This is because the United States have, you know, well, what, well you know, one of the, the biggest base or military base in, in the region. And uh, in your paper, I didn't read your paper, but the summary presentation, uh, I think from what I understood that you didn't focus on the approaching the people, not the government. You know, I'm from Libya. And uh, I've been to Egypt five times. I have to be honest here, okay? In the region, we think, or we, we sound that well, the United States is an enemy. I have to be honest with that. The reason is not because it's because of the Israeli Arab conflict. We think or we believe that uh, Israel, uh, the United States of, uh, of America always stands beside the Israeli instead of being neutral in this conflict. What makes you, uh, this, is, uh, this is what we have to focus on. I mean, what you feel, what's the strategic goal the United States is going to gain from establishing a democratic states in Libya or Egypt. Well, so this is the and my, my question. As long as this conflict exists, I mean, the United, the United States will not uh, gain support or find, uh, well, you will you will you always see hostility from the people, not just from the government, toward the United States. When you say this conflict, you mean the Arab Israeli conflict? Excuse me? When you say as long as this conflict Exist. Yeah, I mean this conflict. The Israel Israel left. Left. Okay, well, thankfully, this is the only okay. conflict we have so far. But, but good uh, question. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So and the question really is can I just cut you off there because there's a few other hands? No, just, I have to, just one remark, not a question. Actually, okay. I have to disagree with what you okay. said about the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's a rival between the Muslim Brotherhood and Turkey, but we don't, like, I don't see this as, you know, as a fact because, you know, if you see, if you read the Prime Minister, the Turkish Prime Minister, his ideology is for us actually is based on uh, a book that you know, were written by the Hassan Bedna, I'm sure you're familiar with, the guy who founded the, the Muslim Brotherhood. So at the, uh, in terms of ideology, they are very similar. I don't think this is going to be a rival. They're not rivals in the region. So if I can summarize the question, it's really a question about the motives behind U.S. foreign policy toward the region. Um, how does one explain the different postures? What's in it for the United States strategically to promote democratic change in the region? That strikes sort of, I think, many people from the Middle East as somewhat odd after supporting dictators for decades. Why is the United States now in the business of supporting Democrats? Uh, um, first of all, I'm a, I'm a Moffat man. May I for man on Israel. <laughs> that means I agree with you 100% on the question of Israel. I mean, we, to, I, I said in my talk, I mean, this, this issue sits out there, you know, and I have Palestinian friends and I have lots of Israeli relatives, okay? And it's, very, it's a very difficult subject for me, but until we recognize that there has to be a two-state solution which both peoples can live with, uh, we're not gonna solve, you know, no amount of so, soft power and publicity and, and, you know, framing our, you know, whatever, is gonna resolve the problem because we have a problem that's not about, it's not because people hate us for some cultural reason, although there are haters out there that leverage distress, but the distress is over the failure to 
address this problem head on and push for a settlement. So I agree with you. And to the extent now you say people versus governments, well, the, what's going on in the region is people and governments are to some extent, to some extent being reconciled in very complex ways. And we have to deal with the reality that while Morsi is not going to step away from there, if the peace treaty with Israel anytime soon, in the long run, that's, that peace treaty will not hold without a solution to the Palestinian issue. So, and I, you know, I, I agree with you completely. On Bahrain, well, you answered the question in your, in your question. There's a fleet there, we have military interests, and they took precedence, that plus our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Of course, the Saudis intervened uh, through the Gulf Council. So, you know, clearly, uh, on that particular score, our security interests trumped everything else. And you can argue whether that was good or bad, that's another matter. Here. By the way, the, the, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in, in, the, the, in the few weeks leading up to the Arab Spring in, in meetings in the White House with a bunch of academics and so on, because we have an academic president, and he thinks academics can be helpful. Uh, he may be wrong, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, this was you know, this was an administration that was trying to, you know, you, you think that the, you think you can con you can conjure up a motive, an explanation, and I think you're wrong. I mean, this is improvised, and this is uh, taking it one step at a time and seeing what what they were dealing with, and and sort of running to play catch up, and ultimately embracing something they couldn't stop. I don't see this as some part of some greater coherent strategy for better or for worse. The administration has trouble, as every administration to some extent has, coming up with su such a strategy. Maybe it's asking too much. By the way, it simply may not be possible. Okay, let's take three final questions. One. Keenan, and then Erica, and then the other people have their hands up. Maybe you can chat with uh, Daniel after the, after the talk. Uh, so at the back here. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, because Egypt has a new government that's arising, sort of, it's a third world economy, or I'm not sure, um, but what is Egypt's role in the new globalized economy? Well, the Egyptians, of course, would like to... What is Egypt's role in the globalized economy? You know, the Egyptian economy has to find a way to fit into that globalized economy. They haven't done so. Most of Egypt's money comes from receipts from oil, from, 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 from tourism, and from the Suez Canal. And, uh, and there are pockets of entrepreneurship that have created links between Egypt and the greater global economy, but they haven't sort of weaned themselves off that basic foundation of rent. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how this can be done, by the way. Um, it's impossible to see Egypt moving forward, for example, without resuscitating the tourist in tourism industry. It's an absolute central, what you're talking about is a much bigger project that would require a much longer time, and right now we don't see it. You know, a lot of the Arab rebellion was in part a, a rebellion against what was seen as a distorted form of capitalism that was enriching only a few and, and, and leading others to impoverishment, and that was not an incorrect uh, observation. Um, and so there is a great deal of hostility to the notion that somehow this government should take a lead in, in linking this country further to globalization without uh, having some way of protecting people from the social consequences of that. Uh, yeah, you touched on this a little bit in your initial talk, but um, Russia, China, and Iran certainly seem like a strange uh, triumvirate of countries to sort of share interests. And the future, I mean, maybe now it's, it's somewhat understandable, but at least from what I know of, the future projections are very different for the three of them, right? China's going to be an increasingly globalized autocracy. Iran will become or becoming more isolated, maybe as a result of U.S. policy. Um, and Russia, who knows what Russia will do. But what is the sort of future of this dynamic here? Will these three continue to share interests? Will China sort of break off, in your opinion? What's the future of the well, alliance between um, China, Russia, and Iran? That's a good question, and to the extent that uh, China uh, continues to uh, its march along the path to becoming an economic superpower in so many ways, and given the, old, the tensions within the regime now that we've seen play over the last few months with, with everything having to do with the murder and so on, you, you follow that, you know, it, it could be that, depending on how things go, that China will be increasingly reluctant to sort of play ball in that camp. But that's my point about how this camp works, that people can come in and out of it. China's interest in making sure that the global norms of democracy and, and R2P are limited in application will, will endure, and they will intervene and, and, and partner with these other countries when the, when, when the demand is there for it. But it's up to us, to some extent, to recognize the tensions within this, this grouping, uh, this entente, or whatever you wish to call it, and not act in ways that really simply provoke these countries to go running back to the core um, and that's part of the challenge. Um, 
Uh, the Chinese have be behaved, I think, quite responsibly on the question of North Korea, for example. They have constantly tried to get North Korea to step back and for, for understandable reasons. So the Chinese have a, a lot of interest in Iran. They have a lot of interest in the Arab Gulf. They have these multiplicity of interests. So, uh, and you know, I think that the, the, the challenge on Iran is to find ways to not simply pursue a policy of coercion, but to find ways of engaging Iran and, uh, and coming up with a solution to nuclear issue, which would be far from perfect, but would be better than the current trajectory that I think we're on, which could lead to war. Okay, Eric, final question. I was, it was a very similar question to Peter's, um, and, just, and it was more specifically on the nuclear program. Given that Russia and China have voted against uh, Iran's ability to continue to enrich, um, Iran is violating that uh, resolution, those resolutions. Um, what are the opportunities for the U.S. to sort of exploit so how can the United States exploit internal tensions between these three leading um, global um, autocratic countries? Well, I might depict the response of Russia and China to the enrichment question a little differently from you. You know, if the Iranians claim that the NPT gives them the right to enrich, and that's incorrect. Um, there's no uh, right provided by the NPT. To, they just construe it as that. Uh, and that position has been more or less supported by the Russians and the Chinese in different arenas, as far as I know. Um, the, the, the right to peaceful use of, and the right to uh, creating their own enrichment cycle is something that they support. They do not want Iran to create a bomb, and they've tried to sort of navigate between those two positions, and sometimes supporting the United States and not other times not. Um, I, my own sense, by the way, is that um, you can push the Iranians to the wall with all kinds of negative uh, measures, including sanctions, but ultimately at the end of the day you have to decide whether you want an agreement that provides incentives. And the question is therefore what kinds of incentives can you live with? Um, and that, on that score, the United States doesn't, hasn't decided yet. Um, uh, I think that the Chinese and the Russians would expect some sort of package of incentives that might leave us with a deal that many people would feel, and certainly the Israelis, not terribly happy with, but would provide some arena by which the United States and Iran could then evolve a, a, a relationship that wasn't based simply on tension and conflict. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. Okay, I think that, uh, that brings us to the end. Please join me in thanking Daniel Bloomberg for his Size. I think you've really, I think Daniel filled in a void here in terms of recognizing emerging trends in international relations, linking them up with regional developments. Look forward to, to sort of seeing the book when it comes out. And perhaps when the book comes out, we can <laughs> bring you back again. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Tom Farrow, for your comments and for raising the level of the conversation. Uh, one reminder um, that tomorrow we are hosting a panel on Iraq, a 10-year retrospective. It's a conversation and public exchange between our current dean, Christopher Hill, and an Iraqi historian. That's at 1230 in the new library. I hope to see some of you there. And also thank the audience for your questions.